Stairs, my name is Blue, and today we are lost in the Homestuck Epilogues Chapter 3. <laughs> Maybe 4. It's late. It's like almost 9, so it may just be Chapter 3. I have no excuse for this video not coming out on Monday other than the fact that I completely lost track of time and did not record. <laughs> so, let's uh, let's get on with it. Chapter 3 It's a beautiful day in the Carapace Kingdom, just like it was in the Human Kingdom, and just like it was in the Salamander Village. For whatever faults this paradise you create it might for whatever faults this paradise you create it might have, you sure don't hear many complaints about the weather. You're sitting with Roxy and Calliope on a giant chessboard patterned tablecloth. It's a nice touch, you think, but if you spent any time shopping in the Carapace Kingdom, you know most things you can buy are chess themed. Friendly Carapacians go about the day around you, passing through the park with their eyes politely averted as they pretend not to notice that three celebrities are having lunch in the grass nearby. It's extra polite of them, because you and Roxy are having a very personal conversation. She looked alright, mostly just tired. At least, she seemed to have enough energy to babble at length about philosophical gibberish and things that about canon and such. LMAO, <laughs> guess she filled you in on all the ultimate self-junk then? The what? The shit where she starts knowing everything and feeling bad. Oh, that's not the term she used. She just kept describing it as a condition. You haven't been feeling anything like that, right? What, getting to know my ultimate self? Yeah. Man, I barely got a hold of my basic ass self. Me too, Roxy. <laughs> yeah. She said she was the only one going through this that she knew of. Poor Rose. At least all the medication seems to be keeping her sort of functional. Roxy gives you a serious sidelong glance. Where did my mouse go? There it is. Remember that whole totally unprovoked spiel Rose gave you about substance abuse? She said it wasn't like that. I mean, she said it was under control. Well, what the fuck do I know? The only ill sight ill illicit substance I've ever done is lick that stupid trickster lollipop. Never again. Yeah, whatever. Can't say it. It's much of my business anymore. Rose and I aren't as close as we used to be. You nod, sort of knowingly, because you're thinking about how you hadn't talked to Rose in ages either. Roxy gives you a quizzical look, and you turn away before she can draw meaning from it. Miriam's been keeping her real busy since they got hitched. They both vanished down the brooding caverns, and that was pretty much that. Only since she got sick and spent more time at home did we start talking once more again. It's been great, but our conversations have been a little bit upsetting. And here it comes. The thing you're trying to avoid thinking about the moment Roxy texted at you. About how you haven't talked to Roxy in ages either. You were having such a nice time ignoring that fact too. Change the subject. So, are you and Kelly still living at the same place I last saw? The one near the tower? You look towards the bell at the tower in the distance. It's a gothic building so tall that it cuts a shadow through the midday sun. It's an important landmark in the kingdom. The tall structure for miles around. And the only way you can ever navigate your flying here. Carapace architecture is otherwise identic. A reflection of their functional collective society. That's cool. It's a nice place. Yeah, I like it here. I've thought about it, but I'll probably never want to live in a different kingdom. Still feel most at home around these chess guys. Makes sense. That's about how I feel about the salamanders, which I realize makes no fucking sense. <laughs> They lead simple lives. I don't really care for the chaos of human or troll cities. Neither do we. You smile. You watch Roxy smile and watch, reach for Calliope's hand. 
Look away before you start dwelling on it. You start dwelling on it immediately, looking probably quite conspicuous with how quickly you whipped your gaze away. But seriously, what is up with their relationship? Is it romantic? Platonic? Can cherubs even have a romantic relationship? Are they even interested in it? Like, on the on a fundamental level. Do their brains and hearts even work that way? Questions like this used to keep you awake at night. <laughs> you look at them, at where Roxy's fingers are untied with Calliope's green claws. Calliope is still ring wearing the Ring of Life. The same one you obtained in that ludicrous adventure through the afterlife. And then re-attained in the ludicrous adventure through canon. When it was stolen from you. It's the same one that allowed Calliope to stop being dead in the first place and to come live with your friends here on the beautifully renovated home planet. And it's the same one you gave Roxy all those years ago to fulfill a promise made to a special new friend. At the time, the jester felt so important. It felt more meaningful than any gift you'd ever given. Like there was some grand emotional gravitas about it that signified, signified something dif deeper than than what it turned out to be. Since you have concluded you were just imagining things, ascribing symbolic meaning to gestures that simply they simply didn't carry, like the dumb kids you were, tactically avoid saying anything at all about Roxy and Calliope's weird, ambiguous relationship. Uh, so... But you can't stop thinking about it. What goes on in Roxy's head? What she thinks about you? You and all your friends have dispositions affected by your classes and aspects. You think you know what they mean in your case, but what about her? You can only speculate. Void is a place where things sink, sink and disappear. Where they linger forever but cease to exist. And you aren't exactly sure if your feelings for Roxy ever really faded. Or if they just grew numb with time and distant. Is it the same for her? You search your soul for the answer but come up empty. The truth is, you suspect her mental and interior is unfathomable. In fact, you feel sure of it. You wonder su suddenly watching her, this vision of her that is, the one with whom you share all these bittersweet memories. Will you ever see her again? Um, <laughs> John? What? Please forgive me if I come across impatient, but if we are finished with the pleasantries, I believe you have a choice to make. Huh? The choice is to whether you will go defeat my brother or stay here. Have you decided? There's a choice? Kelly up smiled brightly, but Roxy's face has no expression at all. I was just assuming I had to go, because if I don't, then a lot of stuff will, st a lot of stuff will stop being real, or I mean stop being canon. To tell you the truth, I'm a little confused about what will happen if I don't go. But it sounds like it will be- it will probably be bad. That may be so. We are not here to caution you about the consequences of your decisions either way. But there always is a choice. Roxy and I merely wish to invite you here for a nice human picnic and show our support for whatever decision you make. To be honest, it's a bit- it's a relief to finally be doing this. It is? Mm-hmm. How much have you actually talked about this? I mean, how many people knew this was going to be a thing? Just us and Rose. Well, Dirk too, I think. She's been talking to me about it a bunch, and him too, but I don't know how much he got, like, thoughts about all this shit. But whatever, that's not important or even remotely surprising. Bottom line, Rose has been tormenting herself about having to tell you. I'm just glad she finally said it so she can rest. Now it's up to you. Yes. Take all the time you need. Again, we aren't here to influence you. It's very important that the decision comes from your desire to go through with it. One way or another. Any tampering could take the results. Take the- wait, what? So what it'll be, John? A chill runs through you and stays there. Consider the gravitas of this choice. You try, but you can't because you weren't really prepared for it. You didn't think it was a choice at all until this very second. You think back to the way Rose looked at you before she went to bed. 
What has she told Roxy that she didn't tell you? The chill tightens around your throat and turns into fear. No, not fear. The feeling is worse than that. It's regret. Where? Okay. You wasted your time here on this idyllic restoration of Earth. Why did you spend so much time alone, moping around the house, mourning your dead father, who probably would have wanted you to get more enjoyment out of your teen years, as well as your unusually early retirement? There's so much you could have done. You could have even reached out to Roxy again. Maybe she was waiting for you to do that. Maybe your withdrawal hurt her. Maybe she was heartbroken, just like you kind of feel right now. You study her perfectly stoic face and conclude nothing from it. Her expression reminds you of how Dave used to look when you first met for real, before years of living with car cats softened him up. Impenetrable cool. It's too late to figure out any of this out right now. You fucked it up already. Unless, of course, you stay to choose. You choose to stay. You stay to choose. You s choose to stay. Upon further examination, you realize Roxy's stoti stoticism isn't cold. There's concern here. She's displaying restraint, keeping quiet while you make up your mind. You're sweating, you realize. Cold sweat. Even worse than anime nightmare sweat you woke up soaked in this morning. John, you okay? You look like you're gonna pass out there for a second. Suddenly, Kelly up bolts upright. Of course, what was I thinking? This decision is far too important to be made on an empty stomach. She fetches a picnic basket, which is, which naturally has been sitting there on the cloth since the moment you arrived. <sighs> Here, before you choose your, which path you're going to take, you should decide what you'd like to eat. I've packed a wide variety of provisions, easily enough to satisfy the most ravenous picnic goer's appetite. Behold an array of savory delights for the com carnally inclined, or perhaps something for your sweet tooth. If a lust for treats is what stokes your desire. Kellyup produces two dishes from the basket and begins gingerly unwrapping them. The unwrapping wrapping is so ginger, in fact, that there's something almost dramatic about it. Like the opening theme to that boring sci-fi movie with the monolith and the bone-throwing monkeys should be playing while she peels away the cheesecloth. On one plate is a pile of meat, rare, almost bleeding from the cuts. Bleeding cuts from the animal you can't identify. The other plate holds a generous heap of colorful, exotic looking candy. You skip to the side and peek into the basket to see if there's anything else. There's a book in there, but no more food. This is all there is. Contemplate your lunch. You put a finger to your lips and focus on the food with great intensity. You stop fretting about choices and heartbreak and eternity and lowered English. Your entire world narrows to a single point of light as you utterly cons as you're as you are utterly consumed by the overbearing decision about which of these absurd meals to have for lunch. Meat or candy? Meat or candy? The two possibilities pin around pinball around in your skull. Meat or candy. It's a tough choice. On any other day, you might be inclined to simply follow the whims of your cravings, but no clear victor surges to the forefront of your mind. Either option offers a tempting means of substance. You know that the meat will be rich and filling, and if you're feeling honest with yourself, you haven't had the most robust diet of, as of late. You didn't even have breakfast. It's probably a good idea to eat something resembling a real meal for once. But you're no stranger to Calliope's taste. As far as carnivorous con uh, consumptibles are concerned, you know that every cut on the plate is raw to the core. It'll fill your mouth to bursting with juice. Lie heavy in your stomach for hours to come as your body works to break down all the nutritious protein and fat. It might be tough to chew. It might be even tougher to swallow. Maybe the candy is a better choice for a picnic like this. Something that will go down easy and fill you with bright energy as you pass the time with your friends. You know you need to... <coughs> you know you need to just let go sometimes and stop worrying about what other people expect of you. Or even what you expect of you. It's not a bad thing to enjoy yourself just for the sake of pleasure. But eat too much and all that sweetness can make you sick. Roxy and Calliope glance to each other in confusion as you deliberate over what to eat. You suppose it's taking you a while to choose, but each di dish is appealing in enough in certain ways. Each has its potential dietary drawbacks. 
You don't want to make a decision you, s you can't stomach. Meat or candy, John? Meat or candy? You release your breath when you realize you're holding it. You're being ridiculous. But it's the sense of fussing, fussing over lunch. In the end, it doesn't matter. Whatever you choose, it will just be flushed down the toilet tomorrow. Just go with your gut. Don't sweat the small stuff. There are much more important things out there to fuck yourself up over about. So. Meat or candy? <coughs> it's obvious that I'm dying right now from a coughing fit, so I won't be able to read much more. <coughs> but this is a good place to leave it off since it's splitting. There's obviously some foreshadowing in each description of the food, of what path it's going to take you down. So, I leave you with one question. Meat or candy? That's it for today's stories. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already to join our wonderful galaxy. Comment down below, meat or candy? <laughs> I'll get back to you in some way or another. Um, and I'll see you for our next adventure. Remember, we're all made of the same cosmic dust, so be nice. Kate, love you. Bye!